So thank you for being here. This is Test Driven Alerting. Uh, I'm Rick, this is Diego. Sean, the other guy on the label there, uh, on the authors list there, uh, he couldn't be here. He's busy installing a Cloud Foundry Foundation at the 15th century Inca Citadel known as Machu Picchu. Not really, he's actually, he's actually on vacation and bailed out on us. Thanks, Sean. Hope you see this on the video later. Either way, we're here alone and we do have our boss in the audience, Amber Austin, who is in charge of monitoring and learning. So if you have any real questions, come talk to her after it's all said and done. So here's what we're gonna cover today. Um, basically, we're looking at the great digital flood, why alerting is hard, how we can maybe use a little data science here and there to help us out with some of that, and then what our vision of test-driven alerting actually comes out to be. So one of the things that uh, alerting, I mean, whenever I think of alerting at least, I think it's forever gonna be tied to pagers, right? Has anyone here ever had to carry one? Oh wow, that's a pretty, so that means you're a little older. <laughs> so my dad, my dad's pager passed to me after he died. Uh, it only went off once after nearly a year of waiting. Uh, it was at dinner and we had to go to the hospital. Uh, if a pager is going to interrupt you, it had better be very, very important. In this case, it was. We were going to the hospital because he was notified that they found a match for his heart and he was gonna have a heart transplant. So the problems with pagers are that they don't necessarily work very well when you're out in the remote reaches surfing, like I like to do, or walking the hill country like my friend Diego, or in, you know, in Sean's case, skiing the, uh, the Aspen snow like he does all the time. And it's probably not a bad thing, right? We don't wanna be paged if we're out in the remote reaches of the wilderness somewhere. But it's also a problem because maybe a bigger problem is that it actually works too well in places that you don't want it to work. So one of Sean's stories, and I thought this was hilarious, was that he was actually paged while his wife was in the delivery room because somebody broke payroll and he had to go in and fix it. Like that's not a good thing. And Diego, yeah, I mean, one of, one of my stories is like, you know, we were running our system. Um, we didn't have any metrics set up. And, you know, you don't really get paid if you don't have metrics and you don't have alerts, right? And, like, the problem is, like, I get calls out of the middle of the night from users saying, hey, our system is kind of broken. Can you do something about it? And that was my paging. So Diego never got paged because his monitoring sucked and his alerts sucked and he was called in the middle of the night when everything went bad and there was no good reason for it. So everybody who's been around long enough and I think everybody who raised their hand that I've had a pager before has probably some bad pager story I'd love to hear after this. It would actually be pretty fun to kind of exchange war stories. But a lot of them we found, at least for me, uh, was that there's a lot of false positives, right? And those things kind of suck, right? Especially when it's something, you know, where we have to actually take action to prove that we're alerted wrongly, right? We've gotta log in the VPN, pull out our computer, SSH into 5,000 boxes, who knows what, right? Just to find out that there's nothing wrong here. But they are a learning opportunity. And I think that's one of the things that data science will help give us, right? Is that we can sort of teach the machine to weed out this noise and only tune us into that signal that we care about responding to. Uh, there are things that we could have, if we had the ability earlier on, we could have automated and self-heal a lot of trivial cases, frankly. There's a lot of things, even hard cases. I mean, look at Bosch. What does Bosch do? Bosch does a lot of self-healing and it runs on these feedback loops. But automation and self-healing, that's a hard problem and requires a lot of work to figure out the, the signal that's in that chaos of noise. But frankly, I think the only reason for this talk is because Diego, me, and Sean only ever want to get paged if Godzilla walks across our data center and now we have to shovel the kaiju droppings out of the servers. We're just kind of lazy that way, just to get them running again. Although there's a true story, Sean literally was working at a credit card processing company and uh, he tripped over this 30 amp cord and took out a half a rack of servers. Uh, you know Sean, I can tell. <laughs> a 
Luckily, it wasn't anything mission critical. So the bottom line is the world we live in, especially with Cloud Foundry, we'll talk about that in a second, we're in this great flood of biblical proportions of data, a data deluge that is unmanageable if you're going to do it manually. It's just not going to work. For instance, this is actually, I think, a very interesting thing because we worked a little bit with our friends at GE. Maybe some of them are in the audience today. Um, the aircraft engines are fitted with more than 5,000 sensors that generate up to 10 gigabytes of data per second. So for instance, a single twin engine aircraft on a flight from, say, London to LA uh, can produce up to 844 terabytes of data. Uh, by comparison, at the end of 2014, Facebook was only producing 644 terabytes. And then compound that problem when you're thinking along the lines that one of those engines is landing somewhere on the earth every five seconds. That's what we call big and wide data. But they're smart in the IoT side, right? They basically have taken things like Cloud Foundry and data science and all the other cool stuff, and they've sort of merged into this artificial intelligence. And what they've allowed themselves to do is to predict demand levels and engine thrust and all this other sort of cool stuff that's way beyond my pay grade. Um, but these engines are now, they're more energy efficient, they are more safe, and there's a lot of really interesting things they've been able to do. They've including uh, dropping fuel efficiency, like increasing fuel efficiency 10 to 15 percent, I think. Some crazy number. You can look at the Aviation Week story to find out the details. So now they're using these jet engines, and they're detecting anomalies on these big, wide data sets. They're processing data and making corrections so that the jets don't fall out of the sky. And all we have to do is something very, all we have to do is make Cloud Foundry work better, right? To where we can actually not have to deal with it so much. So we do need help for the data deluge. Uh, I'm Rick, I'm part of Pivotal's ground game on the services side. Um, I work with a lot of our front, upfront uh, clients on the ground, helping them build out their Cloud Foundry capability. Um, I do a little bit of data science-y stuff on the side, so I won't claim to be the expert. But I know that it's a really good avenue for us to eventually use for our own purposes with Cloud Foundry. And I'm Diego. Um, I used to be part of the government and I'm now part of a team called Customer Zero that we help our, our you know, Cloud Foundry users to uh, make sure that they have sustainable platforms that they can run on, on the long term. So, you know, we, we have Cloud Foundry, right? Like Cloud Foundry is really cool and you can do a lot of good stuff with it. Um, but the reality is like, you know, you have a flood of information going on about like all the applications and stuff. And the reality is crying won't help you. I tried. And you know, you need to make some sense out of all the stuff that you're getting, right? It's a huge amount of data. You know, you have your logs, and you have your metrics, and you know, they're coming from the operation side, they're coming from the application side, the services, the tiles, you know, the, 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 the low balancer, you know, there's a huge amount of data, and the problem is you need to make sense out of all that. And once you start using this, you, you, you have this problem that is all the fatigue, right? Like you have a lot of alerts coming in from a lot of different places, and, you know, I, are they real alerts? Are they false positives? Are, you know, am I the right person to receive the alert? And the problem is that you, you build up this, um, you know, muscle memory of just ignoring them, and that's not good. So, you know, how do we solve this? You know, how, how do we solve the, the problem of like, how, what, where should I focus on my alerts? And the reality is like, you know, most people, the first thing that they do is like, I'm just gonna use whatever's out of the box on my metric solution, my alerting solution, you know, just monitor your CPU usage, right? And you know, that's okay, it's not great, right? Like you're gonna miss a lot of stuff if you're just monitor whatever's out of the box on, on your not Cloud Foundry specific solution. Another thing is, you know, let's set up an alert for every little metric that we have in the firehose. And there's a huge amount of metrics. You know, I don't, I'm probably not how many. How many metrics are there? <laughs> there's a lot of metrics. Yes, and, you, and where do you set the thresholds, right? And that's not really good. My favorite way is, you know, the, the approach that I was taking before. It's like, you know, let's not set any metric. Let's, set, let's not set any alert. 
and just, just hope that the gods of the internet help us out someday. And that what ends up happening is, you know, you're entering this meltdown mode where the, you know, your users are saying, hey, everything's on fire, and you're like, hey, what? I don't know about that. And after that, you're like, oh, yeah, everything was on fire. And now let's set every alert again. And you have a million different alerts on the pager going on at the same time. And you're like, OK, you know what? I'll just throw the pager into the ocean and you know, not pay attention to it anymore. And that's not good either. So a lot of these approaches are really reactive, right? And you have to think you know, how to be proactive in this alerting space. Um, and one of the things that you know, we think about is like, OK, let's set up a couple different dashboards, right? And you're like, yeah, we, we can put in um, a dashboard for, Bo for Bosch, a dashboard for your cells, a dashboard, a dashboard for um, the router. And what ends up happening is like you have like these 35 dashboards that no one is really looking at. And they might or might not have thresholds. And you know, is that really good? You know, that's, I mean, you can use those dashboards to understand what's going on in your system. But if there's anything going wrong, it's like finding a needle in a haystack. So why don't we step, you know, take a step back and you know, take a look at what, what are we really looking for out of the system, right? Like, and if you're familiar with the Google SRE book, you know, one of the things is like the four golden signals of the system. You know, one is latency. How much time are we taking to serve a request? Um, and one of the cool things is like if you, if you use a fire hose, there's a l latency for a lot of different components. And you can use that uh, to have alerts. Um, again, traffic. Uh, how much volume of stuff are we getting? And in the fire hose, again, you, you can get how much traffic are you getting on every, every single component, or almost every single component. Um, are we getting errors? Are we getting 500 errors, 502s? Is someone trying to use a resource that, we're in, that it, they're not supposed to? And you know, we should alert on that. And saturation, and this is like you know, the, the basic one, right? Like, are we using too much RAM? Are we using too much CPU? Is the router being able to handle all the requests that we're sending? So, yeah, so the Greek word for anomaly roughly equates to uneven in English. Um, this is why detection is hard, right? There's unevenness in the data. There's a lot of, uh, of cavitation. There's lack of uniformity. There's no way to really find that perfectly well-defined thing in the sea of uh, the needle in the haystack, as it were. And ultimately, the problem is, is that the data just makes it hard for us. There's just so much of it. What we really want to see is a perfectly curled wave that we can just jump on, predictably ride you know, out to the end. And then, then we know what we're looking for, right? But what we really want to look for is we want to look for amylos or evenness within this flood of data. So then at the end of the day, this really just it comes down to, I think it's just too much noise. Uh, we don't know when something catastrophic happens because of that signal to noise ratio being a little bit off. And between the noise and the avalanche of data, we really need some sort of help, right? And Together, we put a few ideas that we think may be helpful uh, based off experience and some of the emerging things that are happening out in the real world. So one of the things we are very fortunate of is that corresponding roughly about the same time Cloud Foundry has become this uh, rising technology, uh, we also see this parallel rise in this thing called data science. And data science, if you don't know, has been called the sexiest job of the 21st century by the Harvard Business Review. I think that we can all disagree on that a little bit. The, the real truth is that it's really the Cloud Foundry scientist, right, which is all of us, I think. So what is data science? It's really just the hyperconvergence of statistical modeling uh, with the big data, the big compute, the things that they couldn't do before with pen and paper that they can now do because we have these facilities that everybody can use called compute that is just unbelievable, right? And what we try to do with that is Wrap data, data science is basically wrapped around the process of discovering and creating mathematical models of one kind or another uh, to, to help us do one of two things. Uh, one is to either predict 
Uh, so we can read some tea leaves and say, okay, great, based off of these inputs of X, we think that Y is going to happen because we use some currently known data to build that. The other is to, to, to categorize so that we know where things fall. So for instance, we want to extract some information about how nature is connecting things together such that you know, the coffee beans going into the grinder, we know the, result, the resulting coffee and how maybe that was formed and how we can reconnect that together. But for alerting, what we really want to know is given the current state of the data, the real world, what's likely to happen next? Or what category is this going to fall into? Essentially, what is the color of the next bean through the grinder? Is it brown? Is it green? Is it purple? So for data scientists, they basically build these models to do prediction using these sophisticated and mysterious techniques, lots of dark arts and black magic, you know, done from ivory towers where they worship at the altar of Thomas Bayes to draw a line. That's what it basically amounts to, right? I know it's a bit anticlimactic, but unfortunately it seems like that's most of what data science is all about. So I would recommend this. This is actually from the UC Berkeley Machine Learning Crash Course by Daniel Gang and Shannon Sheath. Uh, it basically gives you a really good explanation of what data scientists are trying to do. So for instance, uh, the first step is basically take some sort of tr training data set that they know. So things that we know about. We know that there's apples, we know that there's oranges, right? And the goal is to basically take that and figure out what that line is that says, hey, this is categorized as an orange, that's categorized as an apple. And they call this really cool squiggly line that ultimately derives from some sort of mathematical function, uh, a decision boundary. And within that, the, that classification, it helps us that when we see something we haven't seen before and we don't know what it is, we know that, for instance, that, that blue X, it's probably going to be an orange, right? Because of what, what we know already about the data set. So the other thing, which gets us more to the predictive side, uh, is regression, which is just regression to the mean. So everything returns to the average is kind of the bottom line uh, thought in a lot of statistical contexts. Um, so we have this data set. In our case, we have the home prices and square footage. And I would think, maybe not in San Francisco, because I think the, the cost of housing is so crazy right now, maybe 100 square feet will cost you a million dollars. But in most places, there is some sort of correlation between the two, right? So as your square footage goes up, your price goes up, or vice versa, depending on what you're looking at. So when when we see these houses get bigger and we get and then we are introduced to some house, we can actually make some sort of prediction that our new house, the green X, is actually going to fall here because we have this much square footage, which is known, and then we can find out that the price is going to land us right about there, right? But the cool thing about this is, is that using this, because we know this sort of nice band of things where, where everything should live, uh, given the state of the world that we, we think the universe works in, in a way that everything clusters in this, you know, uh, in this standard deviation, uh, we wind up with the idea that we know that when anomalies happen, that that shouldn't happen, that shouldn't exist. It's not something we should necessarily respond to. There's some sort of error happening. And again, all of this is just to essentially, at the end of the day, draw a line, right? And that line we call the predictor. And all that means is that anything that runs along that line within a plus or minus of some, ratio, uh, some range, we believe that give us this X input and we can predict the Y output, right? And that way we know. So that's data science in a nutshell. So the cool thing for us is we need some sort of tool to help us set alerts. So one of the cool things that I, I think is exciting, it's actually a very exciting thing, is Prometheus, right? And Diego, we're very fortunate to have with us, is an expert on Prometheus. Ask him anything. I guarantee you he'll know it. Put him on the spot. Hey, see, you agree, right? You know, you know. So one of the things we want to do is uh, we need something to help us dial in these signal to noise ratios. So if you're not familiar with Prometheus, it's, uh, it's an open source monitoring system, time series database. Uh, it's got this really cool flexible query language uh, to help us with our alerting. Uh, it's also open source. So I recommend if you have any interest at all in this, uh, go ahead and take a look at that. Um, one of the components of Alert Manager basically uh, allows us to uh, take all of this information, group and route these alerts. Uh, we can throw it out to other things like pager duty. Again, the word pager is still there, even in, the, even in our linguistics, um, and helps us take some sort of action. But it also has custom anomaly detection, right? So let's get to what we're talking about. These are the five points we want to have you take away, hopefully, which is 
We want to stop the noise. That's what this is all about, right? Because it's going to give you peaceful dinners. We want to use predictive methods that are available. We want to look at things. Do we care about it? If we don't, let's just ignore it. There's a lot of noise that comes out of things that we just don't care about. And then if we do care about something, let's make sure it's consistently ringing. Make sure the bat phone is actually ringing long enough before we pick it up. And then we also want to do some sort of intelligent alerting, which also happens to be in, built into Prometheus. Obviously, there's a lot of other systems that will do this. And then finally, we want to try to grow this out using some of these data science methods that we're going to talk about um, to build great feedback loops that help us kill the noise. So the first approach is to use predictive and categorical methods to tune that. So Prometheus has these methods, we'll talk about them in a second, that help reduce or find the patterns in the data. Uh, so for instance, do you have a linear pattern? You know, is there some slope to it? Is there a trend pattern? Is it up? Is it down? Is there some seasonality associated with it that we need to be concerned about? There is this fantastic article by Brian Brazil on practical anomaly detection, specifically using Prometheus. I would recommend this as a starting point for anybody that's interested in this topic. And what he does is, I'm just going to kind of, we've truncated a little bit of what he talked about here. But basically, he starts with this, uh, this you know, uh, a simple scenario where you have a small number of servers that are not performing as well as the rest. And uh, as such, they're responding with increased latency, one of the four golden signals. So we want to look for the instances where there's more than two standard deviations above the mean. And so here's some of the query language that you can actually see being built uh, by Brian, where he actually tries to eliminate these false positives when the latencies are very tightly coupled. Because you're going to find out as you peel the, peel the layers back, you're going to find out that there's other things that cause you false positives. So you'll have to adjust for those. So in this instance, for instance, he eliminates, uh, he looks for adjustments that are, uh, where the latency has to be 20% above the average, for instance. Oh, and, and then he eliminates false positives at low traffic levels by adding a requirement that there's enough traffic for like one query per second, something like that. So just sort of intelligently knowing your data, understanding what's coming out of it, and working from there. Prometheus also provides these very specific data science methods that are already built in. Uh, so for instance, there's the Holt Winters function that lets you forecast demand over uh, seasonal data, stuff that essentially is repetitive. We know that round about November, we're going to have Black Friday spike. We know that February-ish, we're going to have a Super Bowl when everybody's going to want to uh, join in, uh, looking at our commercials and things like that, right? So we have to be able to do, uh, do some work around it. Uh, additionally, they've got the pr predict linear, which is actually a really cool feature in that uh, you can take that time series value of data and you can actually now say, I know what's going to happen next, or at least we know, think what should happen next, based off of a simple linear regression already baked in. And then they have the building blocks of a lot of statistical models already present in the derivative function. Uh, which basically uses linear regression to help give you that, uh, and then standard deviation and standard variance, right? Both of which are, like I said, fundamental building blocks of most statistics. So, well, a lot of this is, you know, data science, not rocket science. This, these are pretty simple approaches that you can do to um, stop the noise and make your learning better, right? So one of the things that we were talking about is like, how can you, you know, improve your alerting so you, you, know, you don't get alerted by the stuff that you don't care. Filter out the noise. And most monitoring solutions have filters. So we should use them, right? A lot of people you know, think, um, you know, I'm going to set all the alerts. And you know, you're going to get your compilation VMs alerts. And I'm like, I only care that the compilation VM just compiles, right? If you're using Bosch. Um, if it doesn't, then I figure out what, what the problem is and Bosch is going to try to fix it. And if you have like tests or non essential uh, de deployments, you know, just ignore the, you know, filter that noise out. And, you know, another thing too is like if you're using self healing infrastructure, you should let it self heal, right? If, you, if you're going to alert on Bosch unhealthy, you know, right away, then you're going to get alerted when Bosch is trying to fix something. So, you know, you shouldn't try to outsmart Bosch. It, you know, it's a pretty cool tool. And, you know, with that, we can ignore some of that noise. Um, and another thing, too, is like, we should try to see when 
you know, there's something going on that is consistently on fire. Like, I don't want to alert that my daughter is at the pool, like, splashing, but if there's someone drowning, yeah, that, that's a problem. Uh, so, like, you know, here's, you know, some example of, like, if there's a metric that is just very barely touching a threshold, I don't care. Right? It's okay. But if something is, like, consistently out, then I want to alert there. And, you know, again, Prometheus has a cool thing that you can say, like, if something is going on for more than 10 minutes, then, you know, let me know. And, you know, that's something that you can do with pretty much any alerting solution. And one more thing that I think that it's interesting is that a lot of people say, you know, we're going to have alerts, you know, go to the same person or, you know, the same team. And then they're going to figure out how to route them. And so, like, you know, I can send all the alerts to Rick and he's going to figure out who's going to be able to fix it. But the reality is that, you know, we can use tools for that, right? And uh, our alert manager has, you know, this idea of different receivers. So you can say, you know, the front end team uh, can receive the front end alerts. And, you know, database service alerts can go to the database team and that kind of stuff. And I think that that's pretty important. And also, you can, you know, make sure that you have the right. Um, you know, set settings to make sure that you group the alerts, right? I don't want to receive the same alert 200 times. Uh, maybe you can send me one every five minutes, right? With all of them together. And another interesting thing is like, um, this is something that Prometheus doesn't currently have, but PagerDuty has, and that is automated scheduling and escalation. That is very useful, right? Like, I don't want to get page if you know someone forgot to change the schedule on the um, on the on the pager, um, and you can build that in into tools, and I think that you can even set like out of office stuff, and you know you should have escalation policies too. That if you know I'm napping, you know like, like I do every day, uh, and um, and I get an alert that you know Rick is pinged. Um, <laughs> Thanks. So, yeah, I mean, you know, these are simple things that you can do to reduce that noise. Yeah. So in the end, test-driven learning is all about building feedback loops that work with this noisy data that we're concerned about that's coming out of Cloud Foundry that's waking us up from our siestas and all kinds of other little problems that get in our way of dinners, vacations, and everything else, right? Um, in Prometheus, the built-in data science functions are really just scratching the surface, frankly. And I think that we can bring a lot more data science methods into it because it's an open source project, right? There's no reason we can't contribute just like we do with Cloud Foundry, right? So I think that just food for thought for the future, things that are interesting and I think it are applicable from the data science realm to our world of alerting and monitoring uh, are the k-nearest neighbors algorithms, uh, which are fantastic, multiple linear regression, logistic regression, and Bayesian sort of thinking, which is, includes LDA and Bayesian inference. And then we also have decision trees and my favorite, random forest, along with my other huge favorite, which is uh, support vector machines, uh, which get us much closer to what we think of as AI. So I won't drain all that because there's a lot of detail there, but uh, the slides are available to you on the, uh, the schedule site, so please take a look at that. So all combined, using the Predictive methods, don't care, ignore it. Care, let's look at the consistency, it's ringing. Intelligent learning and building these feedback loops and contributing back to, contri contributing back to Prometheus and other ways for us to alert on Cloud Foundry. Um, this will help us get our first steps toward test-driven alerting. And we know that we cannot stop the flood. It's only going to get worse. So our only option is really to eliminate this noise. And we think that bottom line is, Prod should have some alerts. I think we agree. <laughs> Manually setting these alerts will not scale with the data deluge that's coming for us. Doing nothing is a really bad option. We've seen that, unfortunately, at other places. Um, leverage data science where you can. There's a lot on the subject that you can probably dig into and start ripping the hood off of that and figure out what's inside. Use these false positives that wake us up to actually learn and get the machine involved in those, creating those food feedback loops instead of just using our intuition that we use now. Bottom line is you should have some alerts, really, right? So at the end of the day, get more sleep. You all look a little tired to me. 
It's probably a long convention, right? Have dinners, have those weekends, have those vacations um, so that they're no longer disrupted. There's no reason for that in this world. Let's control what we can control. The data deluge is beyond our control, but we can stop the noise. But be careful not to trip on the power cord like Sean did. We can't really help you with that. Maybe we can buy you some duct tape. So we'd like to thank uh, everyone here associated with uh, some of the helped us build this slide. And then if you want to reach out or contact us or collaborate on anything, these are our Twitter addresses. And then finally, um, if you're interested in the Spring One platform coming up, we do have a discount code for you that Pivotal's offering. So uh, take a look at that. And I think that's it. Anything else, Diego? Oh, All right. Thank you. thank you very much. Yeah. Diego, how did you get to answer? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Let me ask you. Um, so that's great for all the statistical models and, and sort of things that you can have at a large scale. What do you do with like the really singular sporadic events? Like, I don't know, let, let, let's say a, a scan failed or some malware sign or something like that. It's like a singular event that comes through. Is that, is that, are these tools suitable to that? I mean, would you still use Prometheus for that? Would you still use Prometheus for that? I mean, like, if you have stuff that is, like, very sporadic, right, like you have an event every month, right, like in a scan every month, it's hard to apply data science to that because there's no, n not enough metrics. Right, right. But, I mean, would you still use these tools? You can. I mean, you, you can set up alerts and that. The problem is, like, what are the right thresholds for that? I mean, you can alert, you know, if there's one of something, alert. But... Is it a good alert? I don't know. Yeah. Uh, question regarding future power plants, uh, either through the Cloud Foundry Foundation's work or uh, commercial distribution, are, there, are these tools being deployed in a free way to do the smart work that people are talking about? So the, the, this, this, this in particular is not a product, right? This is an open source project. There are, you know, people were working on some solutions like this. Um, there's other solutions, you know, um, yeah. um, I can... Took the, took the call to action at the end here is, here's all this cool stuff you can build it yourself and I'm curious if anybody's, any of this is being pre-delivered. I would say yes. Uh, I think that the cool thing about this is, you know, an open source project and it can be fostered by community. Um, the, the, you know, commercial solutions are going to be different. Okay. But there are, yeah. No, we just have the uh, Prometheus repos uh, that are already out there. Uh, there's a link in the deck that will actually get you to the actual functions.go. It's written in Go. Um, and you can kind of take a look at that and how they've actually built those pre-baked function and queries. But none of those are for Cloud Yeah. The, actually, there's a Bosch release for Prometheus, and it has, like, I'd say, like, 30 or so dashboards that are pre-built and, like, like, 50 alerts that use some of these functions. So the, the alerts that I had on the slides came from that release. And it's actually a pretty good release. Yeah. Any other questions? All right. Well, thank you so much, everyone. Thank you. Have a great rest of your convention.